Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all right. Um, yesterday, we were told that history was made by a lady called Maggie Keenan in Coventry. I'm sure she herself was not aware of the significance of it, but we were told history was made. Today is a historical day. It will always be remembered because she's the first person in all the world to receive a COVID vaccination at 6.30 yesterday afternoon, just down the road from here in Walsgrave Hospital. And of course, the politicians would make something of that event. Now, it shows that we've got more uh, vaccines than anybody else, that we're the first ones in the world to do it, so therefore, they, therefore we are the best people. And so you've got the event, and then you've got all this slant that's put on it uh, to make us think that it's really very momentous. It'll be momentous when we're all vaccinated and hopefully all well. But that's how we use the word history now. We, we talk about something being historic or historical. And I had a very strange experience recently going into St. Peter's with my visor on and standing at the doorway of each class, which has been sheer delight these last few weeks, and very, very impressed with the quality of the work that our students do, even the very young ones, and how it is delivered by the teachers. Um, it's a marvelous thing to see a teacher at work in full flow, delivering what they need to do for the children and in engaging and encouraging and inspiring them. It's a wonderful thing and I pay tribute to the staff of uh, certainly of St. Peter's here in, Osh in uh, Hinckley and in uh, St. Martin's and although I haven't been I'm sure the same applies in St. Peter's in El Shilton. But they were doing history in year five and obviously they did things like the Great Fire of London and so on. And we're talking about history as something that happened a long, long time ago, uh, before, long before any of us were born. And so <clears throat> on two consecutive weeks, they did the history of Apollo 13, followed by the history of a lady called Rosa Parks. Well, of course, I was there. I remember it like it was yesterday, both events. Apollo 13, the most understated comment ever made. Houston, we have a problem. And Rosa Parks, the lady who refused to give up her seat in the bus because she was sitting in a chair that was meant to be for white people only, thus sparking the civil rights movement in the United States. And so it spooked me because I thought, gosh, I'm, I'm part of history now. I am history. Um, so is a sign of my age that I can remember these things so well. And I told the children last week, I said, I'm really spooked by this. But when you've been personally involved, it's a different thing. So we've had this year the, the wonderful picture of Captain Tom Moore, after whom I note they've uh, named the new unit at George Eliot Hospital. And he and his friends, when you hear them reminisce about the Second World War, um, it's deeply moving, deeply moving, and nothing like you would necessarily read in a history book. And, and often, as I say, history is written not simply to recount events, but to put a certain slant on them. So, for example, if someone was uh, writing history of what we call the Troubles in Northern Ireland, you would write it differently if you were a Republican or a loyalist. If you were writing the history of the um, conflict between Israel and Palestine, you would write it entirely differently if you were Israeli or if you were Palestinian. Um, if you were writing the history of the racial crisis in the United States, if you had been a victim of that or a member of your family, you would write it differently from a person who may have perpetrated it. And this week, we have this terrible thing where a number of people are being deported to Jamaica who've lived here for years. Um, it's a dreadful business. And how people will look at that event as being politically expedient 
or simple racial prejudice. So the recounting, if you like, of events in the past can vary depending on who you are and what you're doing it for. And of course, you were personally involved yourself. Which then brings us to Christmas, which is what we began to think about last week. So is Christmas just a sort of fairy story, um, a little event that took place 2,000 years ago, and we like to visit it on the 25th of December very briefly to give us an excuse for some fairly uh, wild and self-indulgent celebrations. Is that what it is, just uh, an event in the past? Well, what we were saying last week, we were talking about impact that, that people have. Um, yesterday, I went back to my first parish for the funeral of a very dear friend. It was, I love to go there, because those three years, 45 years ago, formed me in many ways, and what I learned there, I have kept in my heart and my mind ever since. And not only that, the friends that I made there have stayed with me, so many of them, including Pat, whose funeral I went to celebrate yesterday. And it was, it was so, it was lovely actually, standing in the church where I began my ministry. It's an unusual church. And this sounds bizarre, but it's true. The first Sunday I was there, and I remembered it yesterday, as I was reading the gospel from the stone lectern. It's a beautiful stone lectern. And I got up yesterday and I remembered the first Sunday I was there in, back in August 1975. And I, um, it was a sunny day and the back door of the church was open. And as I got up to preach, a dog ran up the aisle and got to the lectern where I was standing, lifted its leg to do what dogs do, just in time the president of the SVP jumped on it and grabbed hold of it and whisked it away. And I remember saying to the people, well, if this is how I'm going to start, God only knows how I'm going to carry on. And that is absolutely true. And I thought about it yesterday and I thought about picking up uh, a beautiful chalice that is in that church, truly beautiful, a work of art and a work of love that is still being used and I thought of when I first used it to celebrate Mass there and I looked down at the terrazzo floor and at Pat, my friend's son, who was one of my youth group there and remembered the days when we used to clean it before Easter with a big buffer and um, there were so many beautiful memories and thoughts that came to me yesterday and it was a lovely occasion and afterwards we viewers could sit together having a, a socially distant sandwich and reminisce and it was beautiful, it was a beautiful thing and all of that all those years ago still makes an impact on me. But we were talking about people and events making an impact, an impact that would last and Maggie Keenan, who for the next day or two will be world famous, by next week will be forgotten. As indeed, most of these events and people are forgotten. But we said, Jesus is not forgotten. That's the point. And why is he not forgotten? The answer is that he's alive. And so, that's why there is a church. That's why we still come to Mass, because we believe that these Christmas events, which mark the beginning of our Lord's life on earth, are not simply something, simply something in the past that we have um, remembered and choose to remember each year on the 25th of December, but they mark the beginning, or the continuation really, of a process whereby God was coming to his people and finally entered our human condition. And so that is why the church came to be. And that is why the Bible was written, especially the New Testament. 
One of my favourite poems, which I know I've told you many times, is a Christmas poem by T.S. Eliot called Journey of the Magi. And it tries to get inside the heads of the men who made that journey, a cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, the ways deep, the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And it talks about their journey and how difficult it was and how they arrived. And then towards the end, he says the following. He said, but set down this, set down this. Were we led all that way for a birth or a death? I had seen birth and death certainly, but had thought that they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for me, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Set down this, write the experience so that people can know it and hear it and read it. And that's why the scriptures were written. Last week we quoted St. Luke and St. Matthew, and uh, St. John, beg your pardon. And um, St. Luke, you know, I have written these words, Your Excellency, to show you, an order, to give you an ordered account of the events that took place exactly as it was handed down to us, so that you can see how well-founded is the teaching that you have received, to see how well-founded is that is the truth. And secondly, St. John, more so, these are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and that believing this, you may have life in his name, written so that you may believe. And so the Gospels, in particular, are historical documents, yes, but more that they are confessional documents, which are written for a purpose, not to give a slant on those events, but to enable people to believe in the living God through them. And two of the evangelists, St. Matthew and St. John, were present at a lot of those events. And so they could write a lot of it from their own memory. St. Mark was a friend of St. Peter. St. Luke was a companion of St. Paul. And so much of what they collected was second-hand. But the Gospels are true, even though there appears to be some inconsistencies. Um, even though Jesus couldn't possibly be in that place twice, whatever. They're written as confessional documents to recount the events so that people can see how faithful the author is to the events as they took place and that as a result of that, they will come to believe in Jesus as the living God. So next week we're going to think about the stories of our Lord's birth, in particular um, in St. Matthew and in um, St. Luke. And then just before Christmas we're going to consider the event in St. John. St. John it was who wrote, what we have seen and heard we are telling you what we have seen and heard with our own eyes. The word who is life, this is our subject. So that you too may be in union with us as we are in union with him, in the Father in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so that's the purpose. How then did these come to be written? How did they come to be written? Well, in the early days of the church, People would meet to pray. Of course, they met in secret. They met in their own homes. The person who led the liturgy would be the senior member of the household, the father of the household or grandfather, and he would preside at the Eucharist. There were no parish priests. How good is that? No bishops. No, nothing. It was all underground. And they met. And when they met, often those people that met 
had been present when Jesus was alive on earth. And so they would recount stories about what had happened. And in the recounting of those stories, the stories became fixed. So say for example, which might sound a bizarre example, you tell a joke as we used to do. There's an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman. The Irishman always gets the bad deal, doesn't he? <laughs> you know, being Irish, we feel it very deeply, you know. And, uh, but there's like a, there's a joke, you see. A joke is, right, there's an opening line. Then there is a development of the plot. Then there is the punchline. And so that structure in most stories or jokes means that you can remember them. That you can remember them. Um, it may be something bizarre or whatever. But it's, that's how you remember. And you tell that to someone else. So in the telling of those stories about our Lord, which had become fixed, we have what is called oral tradition. Tradition is the handing on and oral by mouth. So by word of mouth, they handed on the stories about our Lord. And it was Saint Mark who was the first person to collect these stories together and order them in a gospel. And the others, particularly Matthew and Luke, used some of those stories when writing up their own accounts. So St. Mark wrote his gospel about 60 to 65 AD, not terribly long after Jesus ascended into heaven. And you'll notice in St. Mark, there is no story of Jesus being born. It's not at all. In fact, we had that gospel last week, beginning of the gospel according to St. Mark, Jesus and John coming out of the wilderness and John baptizing Jesus, saying, I'm not fit, or coming to baptize, not fit to undo his sandals. And why is that? Because St. Mark was very concerned about Jesus coming back. The early church had come to expect that the second coming of our Lord would be very soon. It was called messianic expectation. And that's why it explains things like you find in the Acts of the Apostles about them selling their possessions um, and you know, giving everything away, waiting for the day. It also explains something in the theology of St. Paul. He's often a um, accused of being rather misogynistic and anti-marriage. So in his early documents, his early letters like 1 Corinthians, he talks about not really needing to get married unless you absolutely have to. And it's a rather negative thing. But the reason behind that was that he was thinking, well, we don't need to be married because the Lord's coming back soon. When it didn't happen, of course, there had to be something of a reinterpretation. So you find in his later works, particularly what's called the captivity epistles, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians and Ephesians, a much more positive understanding of marriage which is presumed to go on so that the union between husband and wife is like that between Christ and his church. So the development, if you like, of the teaching was caused by the fact that Jesus didn't actually come back as soon as they thought he would. But that was the whole thing that characterized the early church, that galvanized them in their liturgies, in their prayers, in their activities, that Jesus would be coming back soon. And so the first words that our Lord says in St. Mark's Gospel is, the kingdom of God is close at hand, repent and believe the good news. And you find throughout St. Mark's account of our Lord a sense of urgency and this mention of the kingdom a lot. So for example, when the disciples are called by Jesus in St. Mark's Gospel, we are told that they left their nets at once and followed him, at once, straight away. Didn't even think about it, didn't go and say goodbye to the wife, you know, just went, which is thoroughly irresponsible, of course, in the normal run of things but you know that's that's what happened but there was this whole thing about um you know the kingdom is coming so we need to proclaim this message and we need to encourage people to believe 
It would be about 10 years later that independently St. Luke and St. Matthew wrote their accounts. Now there are significant similarities between these accounts and that is why the three Gospels are often called the Synoptic Gospels. Gospels uh, of the same, if you like. And they, but there are differences. There are differences. So, St. Luke, in recounting the events of our Lord's life, which he had received through this oral tradition and the experience of some of the other apostles that he'd met, is writing his account for people who are not Jewish, people who are a pagan, and so they would have no idea of, if you like, the one God. They'd have no idea of that at all, wouldn't be part of it. They had many gods, and so you find in St. Luke's Gospel, but also in the Acts of the Apostles, which he also wrote, this great attempt to explain to people who have many gods that there is one God, and that is the Father, and who shows himself in his Son, Jesus Christ. And through the Holy Spirit, there's lots of mention in Luke's Gospel of the Holy Spirit that you don't tend to find quite so much in some of the others. And, and then St. Matthew, different again. Same stories, the, the story of Jesus' birth begins with what's called a genealogy. And uh, I, I never read it, it's too difficult, you know. So many, so many begot somebody and somebody begot somebody. And, but the point was, he was trying to show the Jewish people who were his audience that Jesus was actually descended from King David. And... Um, they, they, he traces this through this genealogy rather than talk about the stable except for the visit of the wise men. And St. Matthew, he has many things that um, the other Gospels don't have. The basis for his account is what happened to him personally. He was a tax collector and Jesus called him and in so calling him literally forgave him immediately. Forgave him immediately. And that powerful impact that the Lord had on him made him write his gospel story. And there are things, particularly in chapters 5 to 7, which we call the Sermon on the Mount, um, which do not appear in the other gospels. So you have heard me say, uh, you, you have heard it said, you must do this, this and this, but I say this to you. And um, the stories about when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It was very much... Uh, centred around their understanding of keeping the commandments and that this had actually lost sight of who the person is. And the great thrust, if you like, of Matthew's Gospel is, I told you so. You should have known from your own prophecies. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Comfort my people. But there understanding and their expectation of God sending his Messiah was that this person would be a king definitely like David winning a military battle the military battle being of course the expulsion of the Romans who had occupied Israel and Palestine at the time so their understanding of the coming of the Messiah was to do with that and they found that in their um, scriptures, but they didn't look completely because had they continued looking at Isaiah, they would have seen that the Messiah is the suffering servant. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. And he talks about the suffering servant being broken. He was bruised for our iniquities, crushed for our sins. On, his, on him lies a punishment that brings us peace and through his wounds we are healed. They couldn't see that this Messiah that was coming was to be a vulnerable person and a suffering person and that in that suffering he was to achieve what the Messiah was sent for. And so we have these different Gospels and then some years later, about 90 to 95 AD, we get the Gospel of St. John, which is entirely different. By that time, they had come to realize that not simply was Jesus not coming back immediately, 
But this person wasn't simply the Messiah either. He was in fact the Son of God and from the beginning of time. And so we see reflected in St. John's Gospel this whole notion of Jesus almost being in control of the events. And, and the Christmas story, of course, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God at the beginning. Through him all things came to be. Not one thing came to being but through him. And so John is at pains to point out that the, the, the word that God spoke to make the world was in fact and is the word who is Jesus himself. Here in a nutshell then, we have a, a sort of a glimpse of how these gospels were written and why. They're not just recounting history. They're not putting a political slant on it. Yes, they are interpreting those events, but they are interpreting the events through the eyes of faith. So we can see now who this person was. And that will apply in particular to the story of Christmas itself, which we will come to deal with next week. I hope that wasn't too much to cope with and have a good afternoon.